yeah, so this is my uh, last theoretical input. And I'd say let's, uh, yeah, we can have questions and obviously you can also um, use the rest of the time to try out either more transcribers or um, the critical apparatus, whatever you prefer. Yeah? I have a question about um, native digital editions. And in, this, in the context of um, the evaluation of academic uh, output, often there is always the issue of um, a print book or an e-book yeah. even would be much more valuable than a digital edition for some academic evaluators mm -hmm. that we all don't agree with. Uh, and the question mm -hmm. is, could you mention some platforms that do interesting hybrid editions? Because I think you have mentioned mm -hmm. them at some points. Uh, mm -hmm. So possibilities to A, make available your native DI digital edition, but also generate a simplified uh, which I presume it should be easy once you decide what you want to have in the mm -hmm. e-book, but uh, some options to get. Yeah. I'm going to show you some examples. Okay, so this is a project that I was on that isn't, didn't create a book, but I did created some, uh, wait a second, some um, actually worksheets because this was a school project for fables. And here I cr I'm creating PDFs using LaTeX which is not exactly what you asked, but I just wanted to show you because I like them. <laughs> but um, it's, this is also being created on the fly with the same set of rules. Um, mm, but in terms of uh, actual hybrid editions, for example, this um, Udin von Horvath, uh, Historisch Kritische Ausgabe and Digital Edition, this is interesting because the, it has both a book and a digital edition. So for example, the parts that couldn't fit into the book as you know, um, digital editions are less limited in terms of uh, extent and finances. So if you have lots of material, you could put that extra material in the digital realm and then have a reduced version as a book. If you look here, you can see that they are working with a publisher. If you click onto this, there is actually a book. It's 19 of them. And, and this digital edition. So in this case, this is a combination, so to say, and this project was um, started right away as a hybrid edition. It was, uh, the grant proposal was for a hybrid edition and they always were working with the publisher. Then there's another option. I've, uh, I think I've already done some advertisement for Furnace and Fugue, uh, which is an alchemy project of um, a cool book by Michael Meyer. I think I've mentioned this as an example of an haute couture digital edition because it's very beautifully designed, but also maybe expensive and inaccessible. So this is another thing that's maybe, I'm not sure how accessible it is to most people, but this is very interesting down here. This is published by the University of Virginia Press. So I assumed that it was a hybrid edition, but it is not. This is a digital edition that has a traditional publisher. So I'm not sure if they're doing this, or I'm not even sure if it does make sense. So I um, have written a review about it and discussed this critically, whether, whether it makes sense. First of all, because what's a publisher for? It's for um, making sure you know, that you have authority. Having the prestige of a publisher authenticate that what you're doing is good scholarly work. That's why you want a scholarly press, because that kind of authenticates you as a good scholar. But I think in digital editing, we have these best practices. For example, uh, as they're being uh, written down and developed by the Rede Journal, these good scholarly practices ensure good scholarly practice. Not that some uh, publisher puts their stamp on it, in my opinion. So I think it's critical and I think we should, uh, it's, not, it's not critical, it's problematic. Um, I think that we should put more emphasis on uh, following these good practices and then showing that digital editions are worth something. I think it's having a hybrid edition like that, I think diminishes the value of a digital edition because it reinforces what people are already thinking that a digital edition is worth less and that's why you need to put the stamp on it. I think if you follow good practices, it might be better than a, um, a normal edition, especially as not all publishers are that good or maybe it was just 
bad editions exist, even by a, mm, a prestigious publisher. So what does that really mean? But I think if you're looking for something, especially as an early career person, if you have access to something like this, I'm just not sure because, you know, this project has a full professor who is very important. So they might have signed off on that. Would they sign off on your digital edition? The question is maybe not. If they would, this would be something that would obviously be great for grad students. Because also if you're maintaining this yourself, you have to pay for the costs, but maybe it would even be cheaper than the actual book. Because obviously if you don't have funding for to get your book published, that's also expensive for, for researchers. But I guess, yeah, that's what I have to say on hybrid editions. And also interestingly in our center, you know, because I love LaTeX, obviously I like print. But actually here everybody's very anti-hybrid edition. I think we've had bad experiences. And the digital scholarly editing community also has this, um, yeah, I don't know, I guess they're annoyed about this fact that digital editions are not as well respected and they say who needs printed editions anymore. I'm, I'm not sure if I fully agree with that because I like print, but yeah, I guess it's a highly discussed subject. <laughs> I hope this answers the question. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to add a little bit that I think that digital editions should do something that print can't. And then I liked what you said, Eduardo, that like the print um, is, is just sort of supplemental, like, right? Like there should maybe be print of the text, right? But like really the focus is on the digital edition that is doing creative things that a printed book couldn't do. And so there's a reason to make a digital edition, not just like put a book online and not have a print version. And University of Virginia Press is doing a lot of um, born digital editions now specifically. Mm -hmm. Ah, so yeah, okay, thanks for this input. Look, uh, everybody who's interested, maybe look into University of Virginia Press's digital book portfolio, I guess. And let's, let's look at uh, what the developments are. But, but yeah, I, I love how you brought up this dichotomy between maybe more traditional disciplines and the digital humanities. So I guess if you even suggest this to somebody in the digital humanities, they might get angry at you. But I also get where you're coming from. But another problem that I also see is that maybe this, this dichotomy between digital humanities and other disciplines in the US, where um, we've talked about it, how it's often situated as a service at the libraries, whereas here we think of ourselves more as a discipline. So maybe that's also a problem. And I feel like if DH is considered a service, then um, people have their own developments that kind of diverge with the digital humanities. Because as much as I love this edition, they don't follow all these best practices that I think should be a means for authenticating scholarly quality, but they have the stamp by the publisher. So I'm thinking, I don't know, if you would respect the scholarly editing best practices, maybe you wouldn't need the publisher to sign off on it. So yeah, it's a, it's a difficult discussion, I guess. And it, I also don't like the fact, or I think that's maybe what, important that the Rede Journal discusses these things to keep it one discussion because I feel like this is a separate development from what is being done in the other parts of digital editing. So yeah, I guess ended up with a very political <laughs> discussion. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I guess that the relationship to print editions is also important part of digital editing. Yeah, <laughs> we're bringing it together. We start with the materiality of a print edition and now we're going to the question, are print editions still relevant today? So you know, on the question of printed editions, I'm, I'm also envisioning, uh, because again, I'm, I know it's very regionally dependent uh, conversation and so on, but you could also have a native digital edition and call it in TI, and then not even a print edition, just like an ebook edition. Yeah, that's that is never like, printed, like that. Yeah, yeah. that gets you the ISBN, mm -hmm. and then that you're the national agency for the evaluation of your academic output will say, okay, you have an ISBN, so you have a book, so we'll give you this uh, thing, you know. Yeah, I think this is an approach that we also kind of have. You know, the read criteria say it has to be in library catalogs. So if it's in the catalog, I think it needs an ISBN anyway. Mm -hmm. And for example, an idea that we had for our center, um, I mean, obviously we love the work we do, but sometimes there's also badly funded projects where nothing comes of them, or not nothing, but not the quality that we want. So we also were thinking about creating a series, for example, and using that as a means of authenticating 
that we um, publish some of the editions that we do as a series and then also get them the ISBN or get them into special um, places somewhere, have an editorial board and uh, on the series and then create prestige that way. Or for example, what the Rede Journal is actually doing. Uh, I don't know, I think you probably don't know this German publisher that's like print on demand and it used to be is seen as a very um, low quality publisher because they don't have lots of uh, expectations. They don't do editing much or anything. But the Rede Journal, they decided we are good enough editors. We are an institute for editing. So uh, we are gonna go with this publisher that doesn't have any, doesn't place any demands on us. We just need somebody to print our stuff and then we make a series out of it to authenticate it in a scholarly way. And I kind of like this approach because it's very grassroots and it's just, it keeps all the commercial thing out of it. It just wants a cheap publisher basically that is gonna print the book if we wanna print it. But we, we keep all the power in a way. I like that approach. Yeah? Yeah, so I oversee a hybrid publishing series um, and it's been an interesting journey with it because it has been funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities since the 1990s. And originally one of the ways that we got the funding was by putting all of the editions online, but in a super, super basic way that basically just tried to replicate what print was like. And a few years ago, um, our grant application was turned down, and they, you know everybody was shocked because it because we had gotten so many. And the reason why was because we had this online edition. But one of the reviewers said this is not really a digital edition. You know, yeah, it's it's an, uh -huh. H, an HTML version of these print editions. Which is absolutely true. And so then it was a good point for us to go back and say, okay, it's really important that we keep these print editions because they're affordable, they're purposefully affordable, they're meant for the classroom, lots of people like print. Um, and also our volume editors, the vast majority of them are not digital humanists, so they wouldn't even know how to mm. build a real digital edition. So mm. we've spent the last few years trying to design something that's more like an actual digital edition. Mm -hmm. I can see the why, you know, it's, I think it's important for some people to have some the imprimatur of a university press if they need it for tenure or whatever. I think that's super problematic, yeah. but I also see why people do it. Yeah. But I think the other reason why you might want that is because then you have somebody who's providing the infrastructure to actually produce that serves yeah. mm -hmm. your mm -hmm. digital edition. And if you don't have that yourself at your own institution or you want to do a digital, this gets back to your question of services, of course, yeah, yeah. which is tricky and problematic. But yeah. there are a number of, there are a few platforms that are working with um, both independent and university presses that provide, that have built some really great digital edition platforms that then you can turn into an ebook. So there are a few of those that, but they're still more focused on, I think there's a divide between a digital edition and an open access edition, and those are not oh, necessarily yeah. the same thing, so. Yeah, that's also true. But I love um, how, you, how you brought up this uh, dynamic that it started out as just a website, so basically a simplified web version. Yeah. And now what we're doing is when we provide a print version, it's like bare minimum. It's like, okay, you can print this out, but that's it. Yeah, it's the like nice switched, one, yeah. it's had switched the dynamic. I love that, yeah. It reminds me of the cycle between like manuscript and print too yeah. and back again, because mm -hmm. it's like, um, you know, first print didn't know what to look like, so it mimicked manuscripts, manuscript. and now print, or, and same with the internet, right? So it mimics like physical books, and now it has its own way it's supposed to look in standards and then the, you're, when you print it out like yeah yeah I mean, exactly it's yeah. Cycle, yeah. yeah and it's really interesting yeah. when we are thinking about how to um take it from the digital version and transform it to a printable version and trying to figure out okay now how can we pull that so that then when people print it it looks like something that they want to see in print versus what they want to see on their screen because yeah. people want different things to yeah. the format. Yeah. yeah, I love that, how the, all the media uh, take from one another or influence each other like that. 
think it's a great, it's a great, uh, how, how can we say, we went full circle yeah, yeah, <laughs> in a way. To yeah, yeah, to come back around. Cool. Yeah, yeah thanks. Um, Thank so I think you also wanted to ask something, right? I was wondering how common it is to have a building process or a digitalization. I mean, not only one person can do So um, in terms of review, reviews of digital resources, there is the, the normal review format, that's reviews in DH. Um, so they do these peer reviews since 2020. Let's just click on one of the issues or maybe, yeah. I think these are supposed to be out relatively fast and they're not only doing digital editions, but also I think they would do any sorts of digital projects and they are short or there are like you would expect a normal review to be in terms of length. So they have the project, project coordinators, uh, URL, and then you would get a project overview, I think from the project creators themselves, and then a short review by an independent reviewer. This is pretty interesting. Maybe let's let's go to Atalanta Fugues. But, it, but it's published, and when you yeah. submit a manuscript for a book, it's anonymously reviewed, and then you get the reviews back and have to make edits. So, I, or you also asking how does that happen in the digital process? Yeah. And, and further, if I may add this shortly, uh -huh. I think that another, if I understood correctly what you said, I I am very curious how many people are both are proficient in both digital humanities and the content of this. Because mm -hmm. in this case, mm -hmm. like, uh, I don't know how common it is to have histo uh, historians of alchemy that are actually experts on DH as well. But mm -hmm. I can imagine in my field, in the history of prophecy, how many people are to DH and could review both things, both the contents and also the DH yeah. element of mm -hmm. a project. Yeah, so let's take, keep the, stick with the example of alchemy because I would say I am one of those uh, experts who have both both expertises, but I also um, have a full employment here. So I have to take the time and I can take the time to keep up with both fields. For example, I knew, know two people in the digital, in the, digital, in the no, in history of alchemy who have a one year masters in digital humanities. So they know the concepts and I would trust them to review something more competently than, than somebody else, I guess but they are not up to date with current developments of the field. So I guess the answer is people with um, a shared expertise in both fields, that's hard and it's also limited. So my DH skills would be limited to some specialties and my historical skills are very laser focused on alchemy. That's possible for me to keep up both on a very high level. Otherwise, I, w I wouldn't trust myself to just review any Neo-Latin edition, I guess, depending on what is there, what is supposed to be reviewed, I think it would probably work if it's kind of, or if it has something to do with history of science, but then, yeah, you would have a focus in the review and maybe have the aspects reviewed by different people. In the projects themselves, oftentimes you have multiple people. So somebody responsible for the digital part and somebody responsible for the um, field of origin part. And sometimes even you have someone who is like computer science, then a digital humanities mediator who kind of understands both sides, and then a um, field expert. That also has happened in a few cases. Mm. And so I think in this case, I think the reviewer, for example, was kind of knows about the Renaissance or something, kind of the period, and also digital humanities, but not necessarily history of alchemy. And here, for example, you have the project director, and it doesn't mention the one who is the editor. 
it only mentions the person who's responsible for the digital part. So that's interesting on the reviews in DH. Um, so this is a different, we know her. And um, Megan and I know the editors from the Alchemy side. But uh, so Alison Levi uh, is known here at the center by the digital humanities people. So everybody kind of knows somebody, but uh, not necessarily the same people. So it's interesting, they're two different people. And this review, because it's reviews in DH, probably also made the choice to not mention the other people because they say that the digital part of the project, that was not um, Tara Numadal who did that, which is fair also to credit digital humanities people. This is the, also the part where sometimes as a, if it's seen as a service, people don't get credit, so that's not great. So I think this is where they want to give credit. And so this is the project overview by Alison Levi, who is the project director. So this is written by somebody from the project, and then there's a review by a reviewer. It's actually pretty short, or it's kind of the length of a normal review. This is very different from a Rede review. Like I said, some crazy people write 20-page <laughs> reviews. In my case, um, about Furnace and Fugue, about this project that I'm just showing, where I'm, I guess, one of the subject experts closest to the topic, as close to the topic as possible, but also know a lot about the technology. But I think this is probably not always the case. Sometimes it is. Mm, I don't know. That's, um, I don't know which one of them are interesting. There's also tools and env en uh, environment reviews. So for example, I think there is a review for transcribers as well. So that's also something that they do. But maybe it's more interesting. Oh, I also did a review of Perseus Digital Library. Can't really pick one now. <laughs> Let's pick one of the newer ones. Of Korema. We've already heard about Korema. So this is our uh, Graz Korema project by our colleague Helmut Klug that was reviewed uh, on the Riede. And there's this abstract. This abstract is basically for also for describing what the project is, not necessarily the review. So this part that was um, taken by Alison Levi, someone from internal from the project, here is done by a reviewer, which is very interesting because if somebody from the outside describes what your project is, you can learn a lot from that. And then there's an uh, introduction, and it, as you can see, it's very long. You can download this as a PDF as well to print out. There are screenshots, everything is archived, so you can access the state of the edition as it was um, during the review. What else did I want to say? Oh yeah, there's the list of reviewing criteria. That is also pretty long. I've talked about them before, but I hadn't. Uh, there's, it's available in multiple languages. Uh, but as you can see here also, it's pretty long criteria. So the reviews are uniform and certain aspects are always looked at. That's why you as subject experts uh, should be able to also do this digital humanities review because for the digital humanities part, there are concrete questions. So if you can understand most of these questions, and at least know where to look if they ask you to talk about these things, then you as a subject expert can judge these things because these criteria tell you what to look for. That's, that's one thing. And um, also I wanted to uh, get to the point of, uh, you know, reviews being worked in, you know, somebody making suggestions and then changes being made. Mm -hmm. So this is different between a print edition and a digital edition, like I told you. Uh, I think we've already covered the process um, the, the how uh, digital editions are a process and are collaborative. This is something that uh, I kind of accidentally answered by showing this. Or, you know, we had this example in the slides, but this is like a practical way of ex showing that it's like that. Mm. And then also this other thing is versioning. There isn't just one version. Whereas with the book, you need to have the publisher review it before it's finished because it's only being printed once. Maybe there's a second edition if it's very successful. But in digital editions, you can just put it out there, even if it's not done, and then update it. That's why maybe you should provide versioning information, so if people read a review, they can know is this still on the same version. But of course, we would expect that if it gets reviewed in Rede, then people take the suggestions to heart and improve things, as, as far as they see fit, obviously. Nobody is, in this case, nobody is controlling whether they accept that all of these changes have been made as as asked for by the reviewer. But I guess it is a similar process in the end. It just works a little differently. I know. Uh, you asked how these things get reviewed. And so you can suggest your own resource for review. 
Rede will maybe also look if somebody, some subject matter experts see, oh, there's this addition. For example, in the case of Florinus and Fugue, that was not suggested, but I, as an alchemy expert, knew, oh, there's this cool digital edition, I want to review it. But also sometimes people get approached. So I uh, hope this answers the question and let's wrap up here. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thanks.